right, so the title of my message today is Following the Way of Jesus. And we're going to read this first scripture. Uh, Joy, if you can put that on the screen, John 14, 6. And I like to do this. Uh, would everybody just stand so that we can honor the word of God as we read this scripture today? So John 14, 6, Jesus answered, saying, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And you may be seated. Jesus famous, famously said, right, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And I think so many times we focus on Jesus being the way or Jesus being the truth, right? Jesus is the truth. He is the word of God incarnate and, and, and Jesus being eternal life, right? But I think so often we just kind of gloss over Jesus being the way and what that truly means what does it mean that Jesus is the way right a lot of people they they read this scripture I'm the way I am the truth I'm the life and and they read it as as a scripture basically telling us well who's going to heaven and and who's going to hell right we're saying well if you don't follow Jesus you're going to hell if you follow Jesus you're going to heaven and let me say this yes Jesus is the only way to God but often when Jesus is speaking to us there's multiple meanings in the text. It's not always just about the initial words on the page, but the Spirit does something. That's why each one of us can read a scripture, and at the moment we read it, it can mean something different to each of us because the Word becomes alive and active. Not only is there a difference in meaning, there's cultural context. So there's multiple facets of the scriptures which makes them alive and active. Um, but here's one thing. I think people often miss this part of it, focusing on Jesus as the truth. And a lot of people think that Jesus' sole you know, purpose was just to get us into heaven, right? And people will come to church and, you know what, I want to get my get out of hell free card. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say yes and raise my hand at the end of service to the salvation prayer and, and go to heaven. And that's great, guys. That's, that's a great place to start, right? That is the place, is that we start by saying yes to Jesus. But Here's what I love about this scripture. It's far more likely that what Jesus was saying in this passage was that the marriage of his truth, which is his teaching, and his way, which is his lifestyle, is how to get the with God life that he offers here on earth. See, there's a way that Jesus has for us to live here on earth. And I love this quote by Eugene Peterson. He said this. He said, the Jesus way wedded to the Jesus truth brings about the Jesus life. He then concluded, Jesus as the truth gets far more attention than Jesus as the way. Jesus as the way is the most frequently evaded metaphor among Christians in the American church today. See, there's a way of life that Jesus modeled for us personally. There's a way that he is calling us up, not just to believe in him, but to follow in his footsteps. And it can open you up to the presence of God and the power of God like you've never experienced in your life before. When we truly start to follow the way Jesus lived to do what he did, when we start to live that way, it opens us up to things that we have never experienced before. But this requires us to follow a, part, a path marked out by Jesus himself. And I love in Matthew 7.13, Jesus said this, he said, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it, but small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Now, what's interesting, the Greek word for road in this passage is the word hodos, and it simply means way. See, Jesus, again, is talking to us about a way of living that leads to God. And again, you can interpret this scripture, well, you know what, there's a lot of people going to hell, right? They're on the, the easy road to the pathway of hell, and there's very few that are on the pathway to heaven. You can read and interpret this scripture um, that way, but here's a different interpretation of this passage. The way of Jesus is narrow, meaning it's a very specific way to live. And if you follow it, it will lead you to life both 
in this age and the age to come. See, there's a way of living that Jesus has marked out for us. And here's the problem. When we view scriptures with simply an eternal perspective about what's to come, we miss out on what God is trying to tell us and give us in this life for our everyday lives. And so when we start to live this way, we start to live in the way of Jesus, right? Then we start to follow his pathway. You know, broad is the way of majority culture, right? It, that's the easy path, to follow what culture is doing, to just focus on solely our lives and, and what we want and what we desire. That's, that's what culture says, just you do you, right? Just do what you feel. Whatever you feel like doing is okay in culture today. They don't want you to have any kind of moral standard, but just, you know what, you be you and you do whatever you feel like. Can I tell you this? Your feelings are a horrible God. Your feelings are a horrible God. They will lead you to that path of destruction. And there's, there's billions of people on the earth today that are living just simply the way they want. I have experienced doing whatever my heart desires and never saying no to myself. And it brought me to a path of destruction where ultimately I found God's redemptive love and grace and mercy that led me back to him. But I can tell you there is nothing satisfying or fulfilling about living the way the rest of the world's living. You will never find fulfillment in the promise of the world. You will only find fulfillment in the promise of Jesus. And what Jesus called eternal life doesn't just describe the quantity of life, but the quality of life, right? This eternal life is a new way to be human through our union with God. See, it's not about waiting for eternity. It's about living in eternity here and now with the presence of God active in our lives. And this life, this eternal life starts now and stretches beyond the horizon of death and into eternity. We're not meant to get saved and just wait for death, right? We are meant to live the God-called God life here and now. Jesus said this in John 10.10. 10. He said, the thief comes to still kill and destroy. I come that they may have life and have it to the full. Notice he didn't say that they might have eternal life. He said that they might have life. Jesus doesn't just want to save us eternally. He's got a purpose and a plan for our lives here and now. And it starts with following the way of Jesus. Jesus wants us to have that full life, to start living with God here and now. Now, let me define what following Jesus actually means, because in the American church today, following Jesus really means just believing in him, right? People raise their hand at the end of service and say that salvation prayer, and then they go on about living their lives, you know, I heard a story recently that China is rewriting the Bible and taking all the stuff out of it that they don't like. And I, I looked at it at first, I'm furious, but then I look at the American church today. And although we're not physically rewriting it, I can tell you there's churches all around us that are picking what they want to hear and picking parts of scriptures that they want to teach and twisting them to mean what they want them to mean. And they're not standing on the truth of the word of God. And so we have to get back to believing what Jesus says. There's a way that he tells us to follow him, right? It's, it's not just getting saved. That's a great start. That's where we all start from. But Jesus, he calls us, he says, come and follow me. Notice, he doesn't say, come and believe in me. He says, come and follow me. Belief is the beginning. It's the seed that's planted in our souls where we start to come to life. But he wants us to move beyond the elementary things. He wants us to follow him, to become more like him, to allow him to shape us every day of our lives. Jesus is looking for followers, disciples, or my favorite term is apprentices. I love that because for the last 25 years, I've been an electrician, and so I understand apprenticeship. You know, and Jesus is calling us in that same way to, to follow him every single day 
When I was an apprentice, every day I went to work and worked for one journeyman or master that taught me how to do everything that I do. And I would imitate how he did the work. I would imitate his behaviors and his habits and his patterns. All of these things, I, I would imitate them until I became efficient on my own. And then I lived in that way. And that's what Jesus is calling us to do, to be an apprentice or a disciple of him. And so uh, if we're going to follow Jesus in the way of Jesus, there's a few things we have to learn. And, and I'm going to share a couple of things with you today. And guys, this is just the tip of the iceberg. But I feel like this is a really good place for us to start. So if you're taking notes today, uh, write down this first point. Uh, my first point today is if we're going to follow the way of Jesus, we must take up our cross. And guys, I've heard this saying and this preached in churches for years. And one of the things that drives me the most crazy is when you go to church and you, you hear a different language called Christianese. And it sounds really great, but how does that apply to my life? How on Monday morning at work do I take what I heard on Sunday and apply it to my life on Monday? And so we're going to break this down here shortly. Uh, but first, let's look at this scripture, Luke 9.23. Luke 9.23 said, uh, Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Notice if you look at that in, in my notes, I, I underlined deny himself and take up his cross daily. Right? And it's interesting. Let me give you some context on, on this passage of scripture. So in Luke 9, what had just happened was Jesus and his disciples, they just fed the 5,000. Right? And so they'd just done this massive miracle. And people are starting to believe in Jesus. And, and then Jesus pulls his disciples away and he asks them a question. He says, who do the people say that I am? And, and they say, well, some say that you're John the Baptist reincarnated. Some say that you're Elijah or a prophet. And he looks at him, he says, who do you say that I am? And he, Peter's like, you are the Christ, the Messiah, right? And so what we're looking at in this scripture is Jesus is addressing people who have come to believe in him, right? Even, even if some of the people, they're, they're not quite there yet, they believe he's someone special, they might not uh, have an understanding that he's the Messiah, but clearly the disciples at this point know this is the Messiah, this is the Son of God. And I find it very interesting, the first thing that Jesus tells people after they believe in him is to deny themselves, it's interesting. After the belief, what's the first thing? Deny yourself. I don't know about you guys, but in the, in the world we live in today, self-denial is not really high on everybody's priority list. We have become an instant gratification fast food generation that wants everything now. I don't want Amazon tomorrow. I want Amazon today. Just deliver. I'm going to click the button. I want it in 10 minutes delivered to my house. Make that happen. Right? We want it to happen now. And so self-denial is not really high on our priority list. But what was the first thing Jesus did after he was baptized before he started his ministry? He went 40 days into the wilderness and practiced self-denial. Have you guys ever fasted 24 hours without food? Like, you might as well just call me the devil himself. I am not a nice person without food. It is a challenge. I typically go in my room and spend a lot of time alone when I'm fasting, right? Jesus fasted for 40 days. The amount of self-denial and self-restraint that it took. But what does it say when he came out of that period? It said he came out with power. See, there's power when we learn to deny ourselves. And you say, what does that have to do with taking up your cross? Well, let me explain it this way. Taking up your cross essentially is like bearing a burden. It's, it's a weight that we carry. I, I like to think of, it, think of it as a struggle. 
it's a struggle that we deal. We all have our own struggles, right? We all have things that we battle with, sins that we continually are, are taunting us and trying to entice us and take hold of us. And so we all have this cross we have to bear. And everything that I've ever struggled with always has to do with fulfilling the desires of my flesh. And so the cross we bear and denying ourself are one in the same. It's something that we have to begin to practice, to bear that weight in self-denial and say, okay, I'm going to say no to my flesh so that I can say yes to what Jesus has for us. And see, Jesus calling in this, in this passage, he's, he's calling everyone. He's calling the sinner and the tax collector, the addict, the broken, but he's also calling the righteous. He's calling those who claim to be righteous. He's calling, he, you know how, I don't know if you've ever met those people where they're, you know, they show up to church in their Sunday best and you just, like, from the outward appearance, they look like, man, they got their life all together. But if you spend a day in their shoes, man, what a mess, right? <laughs> Jesus is calling everyone. He's saying, come and follow this way of living. But can I tell you that following Jesus in this way will cost you? I'm not ever going to be one of those preachers that, like, just come follow Jesus. Your whole life will be better. I mean, it, I, I can put it this way. I don't understand how people do life without Jesus. Because the difficulties and the challenges are going to come whether you follow Jesus or not. But when you have Jesus at the center of your life, at the core of your life, you aren't alone in your struggle. He's with us in the eye of the storm. He is there to comfort, to restore. When we walk through trauma, when we walk through difficulties, he's there to comfort us and heal us and restore us. And this is the way that Jesus wants us to live. Amen? So if you follow Jesus, you will have to, you will have to stand on the truth of Jesus and declare the love of Jesus while living in the way of Jesus. This is not an easy task. It is, it is really easy to declare the truth without love and without living by example. There's a lot of Christians that will condemn everything and everyone around them, and what they're saying might be truth, that yes, this is a sin, yes, this is a problem, but notice how Jesus delivered the truth. He delivers the truth in love. And he lived it out by example. And this is what Jesus is calling us to. To be a people of truth. And, and I, you know, my pastor uh, once said, he said, you know, it's one thing, you know, we are called to stand on our beliefs and not waver. But it's one thing to tell people that they're in sin with judgment. And it's another people to call another thing, to call people up from their sin with love, right? And so how we, how we live out the gospel, how we live out the love of Jesus is going to matter. And I can tell you this isn't easy, right? The real truth and love that God declares are not widely accepted in culture today. You know, you'll have people rise up against you. You'll have people mistreat you and talk bad about you. But I can tell you, if you are walking in the way of Jesus, the protection and the grace of God will be on your life in a way that you've never experienced before. I, I love this story. I was just reading the other day where, where Paul got stoned and they thought he was dead. And then he got up and, and went to someone's house and, and he, was, he counted himself worthy of being persecuted. He counted himself worthy. Multiple times you read about the disciples being beaten and they counted themselves worthy. They counted themselves worthy to be persecuted for the gospel. I think persecution is probably the furthest thing that we want to experience in our life. And I don't blame you. I'm on that same boat. I do not want to be persecuted. But are we willing to follow Jesus no matter the cost? Are we willing to go down a road that might be difficult? Because I can tell you this, following Jesus will require you to reorder your entire life around him. It's going to require you to put him before your job, before your money, 
before your entertainment, before your family. It's going to require him to place him at the center of your life. But this is what I can tell you. When you put Jesus at the center and reorder everything around him, things in your life will start to work out. There's a reason in our solar system everything rotates around the sun. Everything in our life is meant to rotate around the sun. Our lives are meant to rotate around Jesus. Jesus goes on to say in Matthew 10, 38, he says, and he who does not take his cross and follow after me are not worthy of me. See, we all have a cross to bear. We struggle in different areas, but I believe that we can sum up most of our struggles by simply calling them the flesh. And I love what R.C. Uh, Sproul said. He said, the great triad of enemies for Christian growth contain the world, the flesh, and the devil. Right? The world being the cultural influences that try to shape us every day, that try to um, wear down the morality that we have in our lives to accept everything is okay. Culture, the world trying to shape us, the flesh being what we desire in our hearts, in our minds, in our physical bodies. Right, and the devil being the, the father of lies and the accuser. But one of our greatest enemies is the temptation to give our flesh whatever it wants. Every single day, we are going to be faced with challenges in our physical body, in our minds, in our hearts of what we want to do that conflict with the Spirit of God inside of us. Paul even tells us, right? He's like, in Romans, he's like, I, I don't know why I do the things I don't want to do. What I, what I want to do, I don't do, and what I don't want to do, that's what I end up doing, right? Paul tells us that. It's, this is not a new struggle for us, but our flesh is the thing that will continually battle against our spirit. We're in a constant struggle with our flesh. The take up our cross means that we're going to choose to say no to the desires of our flesh and say yes uh, to the way of Jesus. And, and so let's make this practical, right? Let's, I'm going to give you a couple of scenarios uh, just to make this practical, what taking up your cross could look like in your life. Um, let's say that you, you wake up every morning and, and first thing you do, you put on the news. Last thing you do at night before bed, you put on the news because, you know, you just want to know what's going on in the world today and, and you want to stay with current events. But you find your life is full of anxiety and stress and anger. You're angry because of how bad the world is out there. And your life starts to be overcome with anxiety and it starts to bleed out on your family and on your relationships and on your me mental wellness, right? Taking up your cross in that scenario would, would be, you know what, I'm going to say no to starting my day with the news of the world and I'm going to start my day with the good news of Jesus, right? Right? It's a simple, it might not be simple for all of us. Some of us really love the news. Not me particular. I'm looking at a few people, but I won't point out anybody. Um, but when anxiety, when, and I'm not saying don't stay current on events and stuff. I'm saying there's got to be balance in your life. And so sometimes taking up your cross is simply saying, you know, I'm going to say no to that to do what's healthy and what's better for my soul, right? And and another scenario, let's, let's, let's get real. Let's say you struggle with lust, pornography, and you're constantly watching Netflix and movies that are showing nudity and adult content, and it's filling your mind with impure things, right? Taking up your cross in that scenario is a saying, you know what, I'm not going to watch that show anymore because I know in that show there's inappropriate content that is causing my mind to go to unhealthy places. And so I'm going to limit myself. I'm going to take up my cross and say no to what my flesh wants to watch, no matter how good that show might be. I don't know. I, have you ever watched a show that you would have been like, man, that show would have been great if it didn't have that bad stuff in it, right? Taking up our cross in that scenario means I'm going to say no to watching that show so that I can say yes to the purity of my soul, right? Or... Let's say, um, another scenario, last one. Let's say that you are always so busy, right? I, I can't tell you how many people I've talked to say, I don't have time for a devotional life. I don't have time to spend 
in the Word of God or in prayer every morning. I just don't have time. But throughout the day, how many of you get those alerts on your phone for how many hours a day you spend weekly on your phone? Right? We are filling every moment where we don't have something to do with the device in front of our face that has either a negative uh, influence on us or a neutral influence on us. Occasionally, we'll put on a worship song or, or maybe do our devotions on our phone. But most of the time, it's scrolling, it's playing games, it's doing something that has no positive influence on your soul. So taking up your cross in this scenario would say, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to limit the amount of time that I spend on my phone, and I'm going to make time to spend with the creator of the universe. So those are just a few practical examples of saying no to your flesh and taking up your cross and following him. And so I want you guys to practice this uh, this week. It's practice saying no to something each day. Even if it's small, and I'll give you just a small, say, say you have a box of donuts on your counter. And you wake up first thing in the morning, I know you do, and you wake up first thing in the morning, and you're making a cup of coffee, and there's a donut there. Say no to that. Make yourself something healthy like some eggs. Even if later in the day you eat that same donut, it's not about the, what you're doing. It's about the practice of saying no. And if you can build on the practice of saying no, you will see drastic changes in your life. And so once we start taking up our cross, we start learning to say no to our flesh, it leads me to my second point. If you're taking notes, write this down. We have to learn how to slow down. Life has become so busy that most people just don't have time for God. Imagine if your way of life were to be unhurried with Jesus. You'd feel the presence of God. You'd hear his voice better. You'd experience his grace and his wisdom in your relationships, at your work. If you took time to spend with Jesus in an unhurried way of living, to say no to the distractions of the world, it would change you from the inside out. And we see Jesus' example in Luke uh, 5, 16. It said, but Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. In Mark 135, it says, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. You know, if Jesus did his prayer and devotion first thing in the morning, I think it's a good bet that we should probably fit that into our lives as one of our spiritual disciplines as well. If Jesus needed to get away before he started his day, I think we probably need to have some alone time with God before we start our day as well. The psalmist said in, in Psalms 46.10, be still and know that I am God. What does it mean to be still and know God? This is probably one of the most neglected parts of our spiritual life today. We're so busy that we just don't have time for God. We don't slow down and create enough margin in our lives to spend with God. We have to have the room. And I love what uh, Corey Ten Boom said. If the devil cannot make us bad, he will make us busy. And you'll notice that Jesus was never too busy. When he was going somewhere, he always created time and space for those who needed him. We see in Mark 5 when Jesus was on his way to heal Jairus' uh, Jairus's daughter. And a woman in the crowd with the issue of blood came and touched him and got healed. What did he do? He stopped and he made time for the woman, right? We, we, see, um, we see when Lazarus was, uh, was on his deathbed when he was dying, right? What did Jesus do? Did he rush to Lazarus? No, he stayed where he was for two more days. We see another time where Jesus is teaching and people start bringing little children to him and disciples are like, get away, get away, you know, stop bothering the teacher. And Jesus says, no, 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 bring the children to me. He makes time even for the children to come and sit on his lap and spend time with him. So Jesus, no matter what he was doing or where he was going, would make time to be in the moment with those who needed him. 
There's countless stories of Jesus being unhurried by the demands of life and slowing down for what was truly important. See, the problem isn't uh, the creator of the universe being too busy for us. It's us being too busy for him. And I love what Dallas Willard said. He called hurry the great enemy of our spiritual life today. The great enemy of our spiritual life today and said that you must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. See, mo most people are just too busy to live emotionally healthy and spiritually effective lives. They're just too busy. The call of Jesus is not to do more. It's to do less. It's not to get more complex in your life, but to pursue a life of simplicity. To slow down. To learn to say no to, to things that just busy your life and fill your life up. I, I mean, I think Americans in general are, everyone is like, man, I, just, I need a vacation. I need a vacation. I need a vacation. Why? Because we're so busy that we never have time for our souls to rest in the Lord. And so this is what it means to be still and know God, to slow down, to eliminate some things from our lives that allow margin to be there for us to spend time in the presence of God. And, and once we slow down, this is my third and final point, once we slow down, what will happen when we become unhurried is we will learn to abide in Him. So write that down if you're taking notes. We must learn to abide in Him. And abide simply means to dwell, to remain, to be present, to be held and kept, or to make a home there. And the question isn't, are you abiding in him? But it's, what are you abiding in? See, all of us have a source we're rooted in. It's a kind of default setting we return to, an emotional home where our minds go when we're not busy with tasks, where our feelings go when we need solace, where our bodies go when we have free time, or where our money goes after we've paid the bills. We all abide somewhere. We all have a place that we go to. Somewhere we will make our home. The question is where. And this matters because whatever we abide in will det determine the fruit of our lives for good or for bad. And if we're rooted in an infinite scroll of social media, it's going to make us anxious and angry and arrogant, simplistic and distracted. And if we're rooted in the endless cues of our streaming platforms, right, it, it will form us as well, and it likely into people who are lustful and restless and bored, never present to what is. But what if we are rooted in the inner life of God? What would it look like if we were truly rooted in God? I can tell you this, that the fruit of the Spirit would start to grow in our lives. That we would start to see the love and joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. And my favorite and probably uh, the one that we all lack the most is self-control. Right? If we can learn to abide in the presence of Jesus. And where's your emotional home? Right? Because we're made up of this, uh, this myriad of, of body, soul, and spirit. Right? Our emotions are part of everything. So it's not just our spiritual and our physical, but our emotional as well. Where's our emotional home? Right? In your quiet moments, where do you go to find solace and joy? What would it look like for you to make your home inside of God? And to clarify, I'm not talking about like pulling up in some monastery, becoming a monk, you know. I'm talking about learning to always be in two places at once. Learning to always be in two places at once. For example, you're eating your breakfast in the morning and being with Jesus. You're braving public transit for your morning commute and being with Jesus. You're changing a diaper and desperately needing to be with Jesus, right? You're scrolling through your inbox and being with Jesus. Are you returning home from work and preparing dinner for your family and your heart is resting with Jesus? See, abiding in Jesus is about turning your body into a temple, a place of overlap between heaven and earth. 
This is the single most extraordinary opportunity in the universe. We get the chance every single day to make our body God's home. This is something that is extraordinary. Every single day we can choose this kind of life, but I can tell you it will take practice. It will take practice returning your mind to the Father. But this is the kind of life that God wants for us. Jesus called this way of life abiding. Paul called it prayer without ceasing. St. John of the Cross called it silent love and urged us to remain in loving attention on God. A.W. Tozer called it habitual conscious communion and said this, at the heart of the Christian message, God himself is waiting for his redeemed children to push into conscious awareness of his presence to push into the awareness of his presence. And Dallas Willard loved to call it the with God life. But my favorite quote is this about abiding in Jesus. It's from Brother Lawrence, who called this the practice of the presence of God. Learning to continually be in the presence of God takes practice. Or I should more accurately say, learning to recognize that we are in the presence of God takes practice. Because we're always in his presence, but are, are we pushing through that conscious barrier to be aware that I am in the presence of a holy God? Colossians 3.1 says this, Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And one more Dallas Willard quote, if you can't tell, I love Dallas Willard. Uh, he said this, the first and most basic thing we can do and must do is to keep God always before our minds. He said, this is the fundamental secret of caring for your soul. This is the fundamental secret of caring for your soul. Our part in practicing the presence of God is to direct and redirect our minds to Him. I don't know, have any of you ever been reading your Bible and all of a sudden you're thinking about your to-do list or you're at work or you all the things i got to do and you're distracted? It's okay, just redirect your mind back to God. This takes practice. I do it every single day when I start my day. I'm thinking about the millions of things I have to do and I realize that the the passage of scripture I just read, I don't even remember reading it. So I have to stop and redirect my mind and go back and reread it because I wasn't paying attention. I was distracted. And so learning to direct and redirect our mind is how we practice the presence of God. And through practice, you can create a habit of turning your mind to Jesus. You can co-create with Jesus a mind that is fixed on God all throughout the day. You can say uh, with the psalmist in Psalm 16, 8, I have set the Lord always before me. I have set the Lord always before me. So each time you get a little mental break in the busyness of your day, that split second after you hit send on that email, or those quiet moments when you're you know, at a red light, turn off the music, or those first conscious thoughts when you wake up in the morning. We have to practice turning our minds to God, recognizing that the God of the universe not only died for us and saved us, but wants to live life with us each and every single day of our lives. And eventually, your mind and through it, your entire body and soul will anchor itself in God. You will abide in Him. Guys, this is stuff I've been practicing for for years now. And I remember where I started and the journey that I took along the way. I remember learning self-denial and saying no to things. I always like to tell this story when um, I was following Jesus and I'm in construction, right? I'm an electrician uh, and, and the language on people, you can only imagine, right? Well, there was a period of my time where I talked like everybody else. So the Holy Spirit started convicting me and saying, you know what? That's not a good representation of who I am. 
so I want you to change that. And I remember one day, um, you know, I was, I was, I was mad. I, I hurt myself or something, and and I cursed under my breath. And I was so proud of myself because I didn't say it out loud. And I was like, nobody heard that. And I heard the Holy Spirit say, I did. I was like, okay, <laughs> all right. And it was it was through practice, right, that my life starts. And the thing that's great, it's not practice in our own strength, but it's the Holy Spirit coming alongside of us and changing our desires. And how that happens is when, one, we're denying ourselves. Two, we're slowing down to give the Lord room in our lives. And three, we're learning to abide in his presence. Amen? Let's close in prayer. Father God, we just thank you for who you are and what you've done. And God, today, we ask that you would change us, that you would work in us, that you would allow your Holy Spirit to do the things in us that only he can do. God, we submit to your will for our lives. God, we don't want to be the same anymore, but we want to follow the way of Jesus. We don't just want to be a believer. We want to be a follower of the way, a follower of Jesus. God, that we could be transformed within so that we could see the world around us transformed as well. God, instill your spirit and your presence and your power in us that we could be the light in the world around us. That everywhere we go, everywhere we set our foot, God, that your presence would go before us. God, that blind eyes would be open, that people would be healed and redeemed and set free, that marriages and families would be restored simply because your presence is within us and goes before us. So God, transform us here and now in this moment and make us more like you. In Jesus' name, amen.